بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وسيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم افتح لنا فتحا مبينا وارزقنا رزقا مباركا كريما اللهم رب العالمين أدخلنا برحمتك في عبادك الصالحين اغفر لنا ذنوبنا ارحمنا برحمة تغننا بها عن رحمة من سواك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Good to see everyone Welcome back to another session um, of uh, reflections on the Quran. Today's surah, inshallah, is Surah Nuh. Surah Nuh is, um, I don't know if I were, if I were to ask you, how many surahs in the Quran are named after names of prophets? Can I see numbers on your hands? Quickly, don't think. Quickly. Instincts. Five. Four. 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 Any other bitters? <laughs> right. Good. Mashallah. Close. Well, I, I love this instinct. And it's not about... I even had... You know, when I thought about it, I got it wrong. Until I really started counting. So this is not a fair question. <laughs> but you know what? Mashallah. Richard, Dr. Mir, appreciate the effort. Six, actually. Six. Alhamdulillah. So let's count them, inshallah. Um, do it with me. I'm gonna hear. I, I need. I need the. Uh, tell me. Let's count. Them, Yusuf. You can unmute yourself. Yusuf. Yusuf. Okay. Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Muhammad. 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 Oh. What is it? No. That's where. Allah Akbar. Very good. I'm. I'm glad you guys didn't miss that one. <laughs> so we're four. Isa. Yunus. Yunus. Yusuf. No. We said Yusuf. Oh, sorry. Five. There's one more. Mariam is not a prophet, right? So, who? Mariam. No, it's about like, oh, a minority of scholars. Minority. This is not a mainstream opinion. Regarding, one is uh, Hood, right? Very good, Richard. Very good. I love this. This is deep insight. Jonah. Jonah. We said Jonah. We said Yunus. We said Ibrahim. We said Yusuf. We said Muhammad. Alhamdulillah, we said Nuh. If, we, if you guys didn't get Nuh, I would have said you guys need some coffee or go back to sleep. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, we got Nuh. Sixth, early surahs, like one of those from an early tribe. Go ahead, Nabil. Oh, Allah Akbar, Hood, easily missed. Nabil, Nabil is awake also, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. He had a good breakfast or is about to have breakfast, I don't know, alhamdulillah. So six surahs named after prophets of Allah. So... This is kind of a fun way to introduce this incredibly beautiful surah. This surah has a, an exterior to it that appears to be quite serious. But if you pay attention, the essence of this surah, the, 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 the tone of this surah, the details of the surah are quite intimate. This surah is, is, you know, the Quran delivers to you what you're looking for, Wallahi. But if you really reflect deeply, it's an infinite ocean. On the surface of it, this is a surah about a glimpse into the life of Prophet Nuh, clearly, the name of the surah, alayhi salam. And Prophet Nuh, alayhi salam, lived the longest. So he had the most experience. And he's one of the highest of the prophets of Allah, Azza wa He's one of what is called Ulul Azm. Ulul Azm, the, the prophets of the greatest resolve, the greatest... Um, message, uh, 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 experience on this earth, uh, character, uh, uh, seriousness of responsibility, all that was contained within the life of Prophet Muhammad he's not a, you know, a normal prophet of Allah Azza wa And clearly, if someone is to talk about experiences of life, it would be Nuh. If someone is to talk about struggles, it would be Nuh. We spoke last time, Surah Al-Ma'arij, about the paths of ascent, the paths of you know, those channels that are, you know, invisible that take you to the heavens and the character and the, and the qualities that will elevate you, right? And we spoke about behaviors and practices that cause human beings to descend as well. So there's ma'arij and, and they're invisible. People do not appreciate or perceive the heavens, nor do they care about that destination. So Allah's trying to elevate us. And we spoke about sabrun jameel. Rasulullah was instructed to exhibit what's called beautiful patience because the path is, is a path of toil and difficulty and struggle. And you're not going to see the consequences and the fruits of your labor 
you know, at, 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 because, you know, at, at kind of moments, uh, you know, wish, it's not going to happen this way. It's going to be at a timetable set by Allah Azza wa Jal. And you might not even witness all the fruits, quote unquote, of our labor on this earth, although the blessings are already taken place. In fact, the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not witness a lot of the uh, uh, beautiful outcomes that he set in motion early in his life. He planted the fruits for, right? The spread of the faith of Islam uh, uh, to the far east and to the far west did not happen in the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It didn't matter. It didn't matter because his efforts and labor is with Allah. And by the way, for those who say, I want to witness something in my life, I always get this like kind of concern. People say, oh, you know, I, I, I really want to see this thing in my life. I don't want to wait until after my death. I'm like, who told you that you're not going to see after your death, right? Let's say the, the demise of oppression. That's a common thing. People say, I want to see them, these evil forces, you know, perishing in front of my eyes. I say, well, do you think that after you pass away, you're not going to be able to see? In fact, your vision will be stronger. So Alhamdulillah, it doesn't matter when it happens. Allah will make you witness. Nuh alayhi salam exhibited, manifested this notion, this concept of sabr jameel, of this beautiful patience and wisdom and putting up with struggles and troubles of his own people longer than any other prophet, 950 years, right? The harm and the defiance of his community talk about having to have endurance. Not only reached him physically and emotionally, it touched him, it touched his family so much so that his wife, and his son would abandon religion and faith. I mean, talk about being tested and being toiled in this life. So he, he exhibits this concept of sabr, patience. Allah himself is sabur. Allah himself is named the patient one, the one who possesses the perfect patience. Well, so one of the themes of this surah is this, is that in the path of life, it's, it's a path of toil, it's a path of difficulty. You have to interact with others. There is no avoidance of this. And Allah has, it, has commissioned Nuh alayhi salam with a responsibility. And Allah talks about this responsibility, which is to deliver the faith, to remind, to conduct what's called da'wah. You know, and there's no avoidance of this. If you and I abandon this, we've abandoned the most essential duty that Allah has placed upon our shoulders as vicegerents of Allah, as custodians and stewards on this earth to bring the light of Allah into the hearts of people, to make them see, help them see. And it has to be done out of concern for the creation of Allah. So Allah in this surah talks about the content of da'wah. When you call people, what do you call them to? So he shows us how Nuh conducted his da'wah, the effort, the studiousness with which he conducted his da'wah, but, but even more importantly, the essence of it. What did he talk to his people about? What does the da'wah, the message of Allah come down to? If you were to say, what is Islam? Can it be encompassed in three words? I'm going to show you in this surah how Islam can be encompassed in three words. We've complicated Islam so much. And when you communicate with others, your message has to hover around these concepts, right? Without diluting the truth. You see, we're going to see that Nuh was very concerned and caring, but he never diluted the truth. He never obfuscated. He never uh, 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 steered away from the fundamentals of the faith. He was always honest and direct despite his care and concern. Care and concern doesn't mean I flatter you in, with false, with you know, falsely, right? Deceive you just to please you. Oftentimes we do this with others, right? Even those who don't belong to our faith. We try to please them so much and, and, and so on and so forth to the extent where we start to compromise on fundamental concepts of truth in our faith so that we avoid the discomfort, so to speak, right? You'll see that Nuh did not do this because he cared for his people and he wanted to save them. But the, one of the essence, essential points of this surah is that he exercised beautiful patience for hundreds of years. But there is a point at which the parting of ways from evil, from the corruption of his people, had to take place. It's what, what I would call the tipping point. Beautiful patience does not mean you just keep putting up with things, right? There has to be a point, and that's part of wisdom where by the guidance of Allah, you have to determine that indeed this evil, this corruption, even though you're not giving up on people changing, there has to be a point at which this evil has to, you know, you have to stand in front of it and say, you know what, you have your way, I have my way. 
right? There has to be a line that is drawn in the sand, so to speak. Otherwise, you know, it's kind of in, an endorsement of this evil and, and corruption and so on and so forth. So Allah himself is on who decreed this. So you'll see in this surah that a t the tipping point happened. And we know from the story of Nuh, even though it's not a, referred to here, is that ultimately Allah sent down a flood. The corruption of the people of Nuh, which happened over generations, did not change. It persisted and their defiance grew more intense to the point where Allah, and Allah kept giving them respite. That's one of the rules of Allah, is that Allah gives human beings respite until the tipping point is reached. And that tipping point, when it's reached with Allah, Allah flips the equation and sends down his punishment. And in the case of the people of Nuh, because they were so immersed in their evil and their wickedness, in their lewdness, he sent them an appropriate and just uh, 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 outcome or consequence or penalty that really cut them off. You know, the flood completely got rid of them, surrounded them completely and purged all of earth from their sins and their evil. Because their evil, as we're going to see in this surah, reached, it, it wasn't just contained to themselves. Their evil, their corruption affected humanity, affected others. So Allah cut off the roots of this evil by the flood. And and ultimately, so these are some of the essential themes of this surah. Uh, Allah reveals, this is the intimate aspect of the surah. As Allah Azza wa enfolded all these technical concepts within a beautiful conversation of Nuh alayhi salam with Allah. So this surah is actually, as you'll see, it's a conversation between Nuh and Allah. But Allah took this simple conversation that, that took a couple of minutes with Allah azza wa jal, and you know, it was longer, but if when you read it, it's two, three minutes, not, not that long. Eternalized this conversation because it contained countless and timeless lessons and gems and fruits for you and me that we need in our lives. That we're going to be reading it for centuries and centuries and centuries, thousands of years after the departure of Nuh alayhi Who would have known what this conversation is? You notice throughout the Quran, Allah keeps talking to us about how the prophets of Allah spoke to Allah. How they shared their pain, their struggles, their loneliness with Allah. Faith comes down to this. To this. So the conversation itself is contains beautiful essential aspects and truths about our religion, our faith, as understood by Nuh alayhi salam. And he'll talk to Allah about how he spoke to his people and, and how he interacted with them and his frustrations and so on and so forth. What a beautiful intimate surah, but on the surface, it contains these amazing truths and gems about our religion and our faith and the reality of love. Let us begin, inshallah. Allah begins the surah by saying, and under Qawmaka min qabli an yatiyahum adabun ali. Allah declares a fundamental uh, law of Allah Azza wa Jal in in in, uh, in in managing and overseeing his creation that Allah is gonna send prophets. That's the decree of Allah. People ask these simple questions sometimes, like you know, why why messengers were sent? Allah answers this. Allah decreed out of his wisdom that he's gonna you know, put us on this earth, give us this limited will to make choices, and that we need guidance. He put in us the need for guidance and enlightenment. And Allah chose to not talk directly to us. That's the choice of the divine, and the divine cannot be contained by limited intellect. So Allah sent us people from amongst us to help us see Allah. That's the test, right? And people are going to challenge these human beings and say, why are they not angels, etc., etc. People are going to defy but that's the, the guidance of Allah. That's his wisdom. And we need to surrender to it. So Allah says, we've sent Nuh to who? Not to strangers, to his people. So the messengers, the most effective da'iyas, the callers to Allah, جل, come from within the people. They understand their language, their culture. They have a bond with them. They care for them. They're not, for, you know, they're not foreign to them. Foreign people are not necessarily people who are relevant, right? So he's bred from amongst them. He has this connection to them. That's a critical component of effective da'wah, a calling to Allah. So he said, so what's the Allah? What's the main thing that Nuh needed to do to his people? Messengers of Allah, and we need to heed this, uh, perform two essential duties as part of prophethood. They're bearers of glad tidings. Very important. First and foremost, they have to bear the glad tidings of hope in Allah, mercy of Allah, worship Allah, 
and in the process to see the beauty of Allah and His Rahmah, bear of glad tidings, but also not enough. Reminding people of the hope and the mercy of Allah does not mean we don't explain to them and, and you know, shed light on the other aspect of Allah, which is that Allah Azza wa Jal is capable of punishing sin and evil, and Allah does not joke with that. Allah Azza wa does not let evil just kind of spreading its corruption and evil. No, Allah is most just. And oftentimes we want to neglect that aspect. No, no, no. Allah knows what He's doing. Allah is the one who sees all, hears all. And Allah is, is sure He's Ghafoor and Rahim, most merciful, most forgiving. But in Adabi the Shadeed, like the, the, the punishment of Allah for those deserving it is really intense. It's really severe. And we have to have reverence for Allah. So Allah says, We sent Nuh for His people to warn them. Because they deserve that warning because of what they've done in their lives. For their benefit, before things catch up with them, Nuh, out of concern and out of love, had to warn them, which tells you right away that the prophets have to be honest and direct and not like turn a blind eye to the evil and the lewdness, right? And the corruption of people. No, they're there out of care or concern, help their people see help their people change in the most wise of ways. And he's doing this before the, the, the punishment and the penalty of Allah comes, right? So that's what Allah says. Allah says, I send that prophet to do this. Then he tells us, gives us now access into the conversation, pay attention, of Nuh with his people, right? The conversation, the discourse itself, قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ إِن so he turns the conversation to Nuh and what he was telling his people for how many years, how many days, hundreds of years, generation after generation. He'll deal with the parents, then the parents would die, then they'll have you know their children growing up. Nuh would talk to them, same thing, over and over. Then they'll die, then their children will grow up. Remember, Nuh lived 950 years. So he's seen many generations of people. And he never swayed away from the content of the message, which is what? He says to his people, Ya qawmi, my people, he was so connected to them and, and he considered them like his family, his own. He wasn't seeing himself as just the prophet above them, right? No, 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 no. He spoke to them as someone who evoked that emotion of, of, of the bond, of the connection to them. He says to them, I am for you, Nadiru Mubin. I am for you, a warner. And a mubin, mubin means someone who makes things very clear, unambiguous. And you see that word, how simple it is? It's a beautiful word and, and it contains gems. If you just pause there, what does it tell you? And I say mubin, mubin means I'm, I'm going to be very clear and simple with you. I'm not going to use very complex terminology. You know, sometimes people, when they want to impress others, what do they do? Look at the writings of intellectuals and so on. And, there's a time and a, and, a, and a space and a place for intellectual talk. But they'll infuse their language with such complex terminology and concepts that average people cannot get it. Now, this is appropriate for academic circles. But you notice that oftentimes people, to impress you, what do they do? They'll cite terminology and concepts that look like very uh, dark, you know, like astounding. And you'll say like, wow, look at the terms they're using, the expressions they're using, they're beyond me. And in the process, you might be awed by the, by, by the speaker, right? This is not da'wah. This is not da'wah. The passengers of Allah went down to the level of people, brothers and sisters. They never really sought to place themselves above them, to make themselves look like they are greater than them, more educated than them. Never, they had no ego whatsoever. But more importantly, they use terminology and languages that is relevant to people. Simple, ambiguous, and I'm going to say one more aspect. It never veiled the truth. It never compromised the truth. If you care for your children, you're not going to just turn a blind eye to everything that they do, right? You're going to have to remind them. You're going to have to advise them, counsel them. Love, affection, mercy. But at the same time, you have to steer their paths and tell them the reality of this world. That's part of fatherhood and motherhood. Isn't it true? The messengers of Allah is the same way. You have to tell people the truth. You cannot cover it to please them. And oftentimes, we're so shy of speaking about our faith. We spoke about this, I believe, um, is it last week or the week before? That oftentimes we're so afraid of even sharing 
that we're Muslim with others, right? Because of all the publicity, the negative publicity in our faith, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that we're shy to even do salah in front of others to remind them in a beautiful way, of course, in a wise way about what this life is and where we're headed. This is a duty ultimately, and we have to reflect deeply on it. So Noah says, Mubin, I'm here. I'm not going to use ambiguous words. I'm going to be truthful with you and not you know, hide or veil anything or compromise or dilute it because he is reporting to Allah Azza wa Jal. So what is he going to tell them in this simple, unambiguous uh, message? Over and over for hundreds of years, three things. He's going to tell them this. He's telling them, I am all I'm asking to do is, number one, worship Allah. Number two, have reverence for Allah. And number three, obey me. Three critical uh, aspects that sum up Islam, sum up the message of Allah for humanity. Worship Allah, right? We're here to worship, not to debate with Allah, not to argue, because Allah deserves it. People argue over this. Why should I do that, right? Explain to me. Right, um, and we, of course we need to explain to people, but ultimately we have to just answer and submit to Allah Azza because He's the Creator. We're not to debate with Him or argue with Allah Azza wa Jal. But so worship of Allah in all aspects of our lives, we're His creatures and He is our Master. What taqwa? Taqwa here is a reminder about needing to know Allah. It's not enough to say to people worship Allah. You need to know who Allah is, and that's one of the reasons why many Muslims are not connected to Islam. They don't, you know, they don't have the uh, fervor in their hearts for the religion and they and, and they end up performing it mechanically because they, they're not, they've not been taught by, about Allah. To have taqwa Allah means to have consciousness of God and appreciate the enormity, the, 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 the perfection, the beauty, the mercy, all these beautiful traits and attributes of Allah Azza wa that make you want to worship Him, that make you uh, show gratitude to him that he make you see that he deserves to be worshipped and deserves to be feared meaning his punishment that he's real right that's taqwa but it's grounded in the knowledge of God Almighty right so he asked him he said I'm asking you to do this and he's ta ta talking to them about Allah second aspect of the faith right knowledge of Allah reverence for him right but it's not enough you have to worship him and number three what's the path how do I know how to worship you Allah how do I know the halal from the haram? Messengers of Allah, the prophets of Allah. And these are two wedded concepts. Uh, Allah Azza tells us in the Quran that if indeed you love Allah Azza wa Jal, then you're going, then you're going to what? Obey the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And many people again have a difficult time with this concept, right? They don't understand that there has to be a prescribed way. You and I need mentors and teachers and guides. We can't make it on our own. And the, and the teachers of humanity are, are the messengers of Allah Azza wa Jal. The sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is what explains to us, how, in fact, how to pray. By the way, how to pray is not in the Quran. Allah tells us to pray. We spoke about it in Surah Al-Ma'arij. But how do I conduct the prayer? Was taught to us by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was taught by Jibreel. We wouldn't know how to deal with our families. The halal, the details of the halal and the haram, and the embodiment of the teachings of the Quran are illustrated in the example of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the messengers before Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did that. They showed the way. They showed the way. So he's telling his people, you need to obey me too. It's not up to you to worship God as you want to worship him. No, no, no. There is a prescribed way that you will only understand by the messengers who are connected to Allah Azza wa Jal. If you do this, look at this. He didn't say just, oh, go obey God. Otherwise, he'll just put you in the hellfire, right? Oftentimes, that's what we're ta how we taught the faith, the religion, in a, in a matter that, that makes you terrified, that, that, you know, that, that there's no um, uh, kind of incentive in your heart to, you know, to kind of go to, go to God lovingly. So he says to them in verse number four, here are the glad tidings. Here's the wisdom. If you do so, Allah will forgive you. And we're going to talk about the concept of forgiveness. Very powerful. If you really take steps to Allah, worship Him, revere Him, obey Me, mm, the doors of mercy will open for you. And Allah will cleanse you of all of your sins, all the mistakes, all the shortcomings. If you really care about changing and receiving the blessings of this one who created the heavens and the earth, whom you need really very much in your life, 
then you're going to need his forgiveness and he'll wash away purge all these sins and change you and make you earn his blessings and mercy and sustenance all that is contained in the concept of maghfirah he's telling them that's what's waiting for you are you going to give that up so it's a glad tiding to make people love allah Azzawajal and see why they need to worship him why they need to revere him and he says further to them because they were corrupt people see they were not normal people they were not neutral people they were very evil and we'll talk about what they've done to Nuh. So he's concerned about them being penalized and punished and tormented as a result of their evil. So he says, if you just worship Allah right now, don't worry about what has happened. Allah will forgive all the, the sins and the mistakes of the past, but Allah will res give you respite. Even if you're not changing right now, just, just come, take steps to Allah and Allah will give you respite. He'll postpone his penalty to give you additional time and that's the way of Allah he continues to give respite out of his mercy time out of his mercy until the tipping point reaches which is determined by Allah so Noah was concerned about that tipping point being reached because remember he witnessed this corruption and perversion misguidance disbelief in Allah for centuries and he's worried and concerned that it's only a matter of time and it could happen any moment right now because of the defiance of his people. So he's concerned and he's trying to really wake them up. And you'll see this uh, alarm in his language with them because again, centuries have passed. But remember, he kept reiterating this same message over and over. He never strayed away from it for centuries. Same conversation. Then Allah in the surah turned the conversation from Nuh with his people into the private conversation between Nuh and Allah. See, Nuh was struggling. We struggle with people. We go through grief and, 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 and distress. We try to help people understand and they might be stubborn. They might give us trouble, right? Harm will come from them. Where, where do you go? Allah tells us, go to Allah. Go to Allah, right? So Allah shows us how Nuh always went to Allah to seek his guidance and his support. Because he had none but Allah. Even his wife and his own child were disbelievers. Are you alone? No. You go to Allah and you have to share your grief. You have to share your pain. So Allah Azza wa tells us about a private conversation that you and I would have never known about if it wasn't for Allah recording it. And this conversation will be eternalized or is eternalized in the Quran until the end of time for you and me to learn from. So Allah says in verse 5, قَالَ رَبِّي إِنِّي دَعَوْتُ قَوْمِ لَيْلًا وَنَهَارًا فَلَمْ يَزِدْهُمْ دُعَائِي إِلَّا فِرَارًا وَإِنِّي كُلَّمَا دَعَوْتُهُمْ لِتَغْفِرَ لَهُمْ جَعَلُوا أَصَابِعَهُمْ فِي آذَانِهِمْ وَاسْتَغْشَوْ ثِيَابَهُمْ وَأَصَرُّوا وَاسْتَكْبَرُوا اسْتِكْبَارًا And we'll inshallah continue. So he says, the conversation with between Nuh and Allah. Ya Rabbi, Rabbi, my master, my nurturer, my caretaker, Rabbi. Rabbi is very personal term, right? It's not Allah who is distant. Rabb is the one who takes care of you, raises you up. The intimate call is Rabbi, Rabbi, mine. What do you want to tell me, uh, Ya Nuh, right? And he's talking to Allah, he says, Ya Allah. His concern, his trouble, his distress, right? I've been calling my people Layla wa Nahara. Layla wa Nahara. I've been working around the clock, day and night, without interruption. That's his mission. But when somebody, you know, with our children, day and night we're concerned about them. We take our concerns about our children to our beds. We wake up in the middle of the night thinking with anxiety about their future, about any harm that might have afflicted them. We think about what's going to happen to them after our departure from this earth. Are they going to have a law? What is going to happen? To them? Are they going to become ill? Are they going to have money, etc.? All kinds of concerns, right? He did that day and night out of intense concern for his people he's calling them to Allah because he's afraid they're gonna be destroyed then he says the trouble ya Allah is that whenever I call them and I've been calling them not just for a year hundreds of years and Allah knows this but remember Nuh knows that Allah knows Nuh knows that Allah knows but it doesn't mean you don't talk to Allah you don't say well Allah knows that I've been talking to them no he's repeating it He's, he's articulating, crying out his pain. And that is very therapeutic. Very therapeutic. To verbalize your pain with Allah. Ya Allah, I'm struggling. I'm burdened. I've been trying hard. Ya Allah. And then so he says, Ya Allah, all my efforts are in vain, Ya Allah. 
all that it's doing is increase them in stubbornness and defiance. These people are so blind, his people, that sent centuries of calling to Allah consistently, right, produced nothing but further defiance and running away from Nuh. They really hurt him. And then he says, well, and whenever Ya Allah, I get into a conversation with them to call them to you and to do what? لتغفر لهم, the essence of the message. Ya Allah, for you to forgive them. You're going to see that the essence of the message of Nuh to his people was go to Allah, seek istighfar. Just, just ask for his forgiveness. And we're going to talk about why that is important. Their response to me, Ya Allah, for this simple caring message, for their lives to change, for them to change their ways and to just uh, make peace with you, Ya Allah, and to ask for your forgiveness, their answer is this. They literally put their fingers in their ears like this, and then they'll take their garments and put it on top of their heads. Like, first of all, it's mockery. Like somebody's talking to you, and instead of just nodding, pretending like you're listening, that's one form, but you know that they're not listening. Or they might be challenging you, or worse, they'll like give you the snare, or say, mm, yeah, whatever, right? But even worse, Somebody will mock you so much that they'll actually say, you know, when the people say la 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 la, like children do that, right? You're talking to them like la 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 la, like make noise, so that, and then it gets to you. It's like, what is this? Like a, a circus, right? It's really very upsetting. It's insulting. These people went further. They're acting like children, but they're trying to mock Nua. They're like talk la 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 la. Can you imagine? Like. Can you imagine going out, you're talking to people, you're talking to your, you're talking to your child, your parent, your wife, and they're like, la, 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 right? Wow. How insulting is that? What does it do to your heart? It breaks you, right? It makes you so frustrated, you might start giving up, right? But it's not just one or two people who are doing this. All society is doing, to, doing this. They got used to mocking Nur. But worse, they're like, let's have more fun with it. They'll take their garments and put it on top of their heads. That's the reaction. And he's saying, Allah, that's what they do with me. Like, you know, their abuses with me and further asarru. And they increased in their own stubbornness, in their own ego, and their own arrogance. This, this is beautiful. So what have they done? Pay attention to the language of Allah. We, we covered this before, Surah Al-Haqqa. We spoke about how Allah tells us, listen attentively. And we spoke of the concept of wi'a, the container. He says, don't just listen. Pay attention. Throw your ear at the message, right? Don't be distracted. It's for your well-being, but retain it. Don't just listen. Process it and retain it. Don't lose it, right? But also open your eyes. The channels or the faculties of perception are hearing, seeing, and intellection. The heart, the mind that processes and the heart that feels. These are the faculties of perception, and they have to be working. What have they done? They put their ears in their uh, fingers in their ears, and they covered their eyes. They blocked the channels of perception completely. But what have they done? There is, you know, light is upon me now, right above me. There's a lamp right here. It's coming. If I do this and I put my 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 garment on top of my head, I block myself from seeing the light. So they blocked up the channels of what? Allah's nur, Allah's light, Allah's rahma, the channels of mercy, and their ears. So how is it going to get to their heart? That's it. They cut themselves off, completely surrounding with themselves, even physically, from what? The channels of mercy, the channels of enlightenment. Wow. All that is containing, containing this beautiful expression. It's very symbolic. It's very symbolic, and it's going to catch up with them. Then he says, Ya Allah, I call them not only night and day uninterruptingly, but I call them in public, you know, loud. Right? Not loud, like jihara, like, you know, articulating it, you know, in open, in the open. So I did it in the open and I pub and I publicly spoke to crowds. And then I went into private conversations in their homes in secret, because sometimes people will be afraid. And I say, you know, don't, 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 don't be seen by what he said. OK, OK, let me make a appointment with you. I'll come to your home and he'll go to their home and he will speak to them in secret. So publicly. In secret, he used all modes of worship. He didn't leave a stone unturned. 
he utilized all his physical resources, abilities, efforts, knocking on doors, speaking in public, speaking in private, and it's the same reaction. It doesn't matter if he's talking to a father, a child, a grandfather. They're all the same way. Now, what were they, what were they doing to him? Do you think they were leaving him alone? No, it's not mentioned in the surah. They were hurting him. It is actually reported by Ibn Abbas that the people of North would be would, would first of all would, would mock him publicly. They actually started to gang up on him and beat him up. They would beat him so so senselessly. Uh, excuse me. Just checking my internet. Um, they would beat him so senselessly that he would pass out. Can you imagine? Then they would wrap a blanket around him and throw him into his home. Can you imagine? He, he, he's talking to people suddenly. He's just, they beat him up. He found, finds himself at home, wrapped up in a garment, you know, in a garment. Then he, he would get up and, 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 and um, you know, just kind of stand up and like, oh my God, what's happened, right? And he's in pain and he'll still go out and call people. Again, happening for hundreds of years. Talk about struggle. Talk about toil, right? This is the path of Allah. The path of Allah is never easy. It, Allah never promised a rosy path to him, but this is the way of Allah Azza wa Jal. So now Allah tells us, so these are the struggles, and now Nuh is so pained by it, he took his pain to Allah. That's one of the most beautiful uh, practic and practical lessons we take from this is to take your pain for Allah, share your grief, share your distress, in an intimate conversation with Allah, Allah is listening and Allah is seeing. But then Allah Ajad, reveals to us what in verse 10, what Nuh told Allah regarding the essence of the message to his people. What does the message of Nuh come down to when he spoke to his people for hundreds of years? I said to them, nothing else. This is the most essential. It, all Islam, all faith comes down to this one thing that exemplifies your relationship with Allah, your understanding of who Allah is and what you need to do. What do you need to do? What do we need the most? You and I right now, just as the people of what do we need the most is tighfar. He said, please just seek Allah's forgiveness. You see, it's simple to say it, but it's a very profound concept. He says, all I want you to do is just to understand that you have the opportunity to fix your ways to heal from the awful evil past that you have done, you need to change before it is too late. Because death is there and Allah will punish. It's not a joke. You can't spread your evil like this and disbelieve and be ungrateful. But it's okay. You can easily reconcile with your past and Allah is so merciful. His door is so wide open. Again, it's a glad tiding. Just turn to Him. Make peace with Him. Right? And say, God, forgive me. But you need to be sincere and you need to want it. Innahu kana ghaffar, because he tells them Allah is ghaffar, one of the names of Allah. Ghaffar is an intensified form in Arabic, Sigat Mubalagha. That means Allah is always forgiving, always forgiving for each and every one of us. Not only for each and every one of us, for each and every one of our mistakes. It doesn't matter whether the mistake is tiny or humongous, right? Extreme. Allah is ghaffar, he'll forgive it if you seek his forgiveness. But why do we need forgiveness? Because how else will you fix a mistake? And in Islam, it's, you know, the, in the Arabic language, we use the term then. Then refers to a mistake or sin. In the Arabic language, etymologically, it means it's connected to the word dhanab. Dhanab means tail. Your mistakes and shortcomings and mine are like tails that will chase us. They have consequences. They harm us. They harm their, our future. They harm even our children, our community. They harm the environment. Our evils, like the mistakes and the shortcomings catch up. They're not going to just go away. And the only way to heal from them is to cut them off, is to cut off the tail. The tail is, is with you. It's not going to leave you. Allah says, don't worry. I'll cut off that tail. And the consequences of the bad, the, 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 the awful, sinful behavior, the crimes, no matter, it doesn't matter what we do. He cut off the tail because Allah is so merciful and he's capable and because Allah wants to heal us. That's what he told them. It's an opportunity to change because you need to change. And the entry into Allah is so simple. Just say, Astaghfirullah, sincerely. I intend, it means also, I intend to change my ways, right? Islam comes down to this. 
the relationship with Allah is founded on this. And istighfar means I have no ego. I'm acknowledging my guilt. I'm acknowledging my shortcomings. But remember, the people who are so arrogant, they don't even see their mistake. Remember, they put garments on top of their heads, fingers in their ears. They don't want to be reminded. So they think nothing is going to catch up with them, right? They don't see Allah. They don't see their mistake. Evil people are so blind, brothers and sisters. So their opportunity to change begins with an acknowledgement that they need God. And they have made mistakes. Any path of change begins with acknowledgement of guilt. If we don't recognize this, we're going to be arguing over and over, even with our families. Oftentimes people are in denial over what they've done. They're not going to change. So that's why istighfar is such a beautiful, encompassing concept. Then he says to them, do this because Allah loves to forgive you and he is inviting you to change your lives. Now, if you ask for forgiveness, what do you get? What we hope for is the forgiveness of the mistake, the cutting of the tail. But Allah is so generous and it doesn't stop there. We didn't sign up for the additional benefits, right? You didn't. So sometimes you, you sign up for a deal and you're going to you say you're going to get such and such discount, 10 percent discount. Then you go to the store and you're using this coupon and they tell you, oh, guess what? This coupon also you have there's other benefits. You, you just, you know, you get 50 percent off of this other product. And you're like, oh, my God, all that I didn't know about. You're excited. When istighfar, Nuh is telling them, it's not just Allah forgiving your sins, which is so powerful and important because it, it will change your lives. But Allah is so happy with you, he'll do this. يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا وَمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَانٍ وَبَنِينَ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا مَا لَكُمْ لَا تَرْجُونَ لِلَّهِ وَقَارًا He says, if you just come to Allah, you know, seeking His forgiveness and His mercy, He'll not only forgive your sins, but on top of this, Allah will be so happy with you that He'll send you astonishing blessings and provision. In fact, Allah will open up the sky for you, midrar. Midrar means something that pours down on you. Over and over like a faucet. You turn the faucet and it starts to unleash the water on you. Pour it down endlessly. Why did he say sama? Sama is up above the sky. Sama in, in the Quranic um, terminology, concept, and understanding uh, is, is one that contains what? Our provision. Allah says, وَفِي السَّمَاءِ رِسْقُكُمْ In the heavens are your provision. And provision is encompassing. It's physical provision, money, wealth. Rain comes down. Rain is a representation of life. Rain is not something that just will quench your thirst, will make you come to life, but it's a representation of everything that we seek and yearn for. Life, all of life. So your physical health, your provision, your children, your emotional well-being, all of it is decreed for you from the from from Allah Azza wa Jalla, and it's written in the sky, in the books of Allah, and it pours down by the decision of Allah Azza wa can, can, you know, limit it. So we turn up for that guidance, for that provision up. And also the sky is, is the place from which guidance itself comes. Revelation comes from the sky. So Allah says, if, if you do istighfar, I'm going to open the heavens for you. Physical provision, material provision, spiritual provision. Oh, you're set free. You're going to be transformed. Enormous supernatural blessings are going to come to you from Allah. All for what? You didn't ask for this because you made this to Allah. How desperately in need of this are we, brothers and sisters? The people of Nuh didn't care. Look at this promise. And he says to them, Allah will open the faucet of the heaven for you that it pours down on you with blessings and riches. And he says further, he will yumditkum, he'll give you imdad, aid, extension with wealth, children, and he'll give you gardens and he'll you know uh, provide you with streams and rivers. So these were materialistic people, and he told them, Don't worry, Allah will take care of all of all of your physical needs. In fact, he'll give you gardens, he'll produce vegetation for you, fruits for you, rivers will flow. Wow, all that for forgiveness, yes, but also. He'll aid you with your children and your wealth. This is amazing. It's like Allah will bless all that you have. You, you're concerned about poverty, Allah will bless, will provide for you. You're concerned about your children, Allah will bless your children and will multiply them and will make them good children, right? You're concerned about your wealth, your health, Allah will bless your health. 
Allah will aid you. It doesn't mean people don't get sick, but there's a blessing that is going to be given to you. Strength, emotional strength. You're not feeling well, Allah will aid you. It doesn't matter what realm of life we're talking about. Allah, Nuh is telling them, Allah will extend you and multiply you in, in profound on powerful ways beyond your imagination all your wishes will inshallah be fulfilled all for what just you know uh, uh make peace with allah just come to him clean and say allah forgive me i want to be with you that's it you get all of this all from his stepfather brothers and sisters subhanallah and then he says to them why are you not doing this with allah why are you not hoping in allah and having waqar reverence because he's the source of everything are you really rejecting this gift who would do this except the one who's blind, who really drew a, a garment over their heads and closed their ears, that they are blind to what they need, blind to what benefits them, and they don't even see their poverty, their desperate need for this aid from Allah, the divine aid, divine assistance, the, uh, the divine provision. And it doesn't matter what aspect of life, even for young people, students struggling in school, Imdad from Allah will come to you. You're struggling. Allah will multiply your ability, your potential, will aid you, will open doors of relief for you from your anxieties. In your marriage, you're having issues. Allah will bless. All that is promised by Allah has it with istighfar. Who would have, who amongst us would have thought that we need istighfar, right? And I tell you here, you know, just uh, I love this story. Of, I believe it was um, some say Imam Malik, some say Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, uh, some say others actually, but he was sitting in a, in a, in a, you know, advising, counseling others in the masjid, and somebody comes from outside, and he's saying, "Oh, Imam," uh, and he's complaining. He's like, "Oh, you know, the time that I come from, we're in a drought. Make dua for us." What, what, no, he said, "What do we do?" He says to him, "Respond, go make istighfar. Tell your people, go make istighfar. Seek Allah's forgiveness." He left. Another person came into the gathering, and he said, "Oh, Imam, my, my wife, my wife cannot bear children." We have no children. What do I do? He says to them, go, you and your wife make istighfar. Right? A third person comes in. Oh, Imam, I'm poor. I'm, I'm broken. I don't have money for my children. He says, make istighfar. Then some of the people in the gathering with the Imam, they said, oh, Imam, is this all you have to tell people? Whenever they ask you for something, just make istighfar. Do you have anything, any other advice, wisdom? He says, didn't you hear the words of Allah? Right? In Surah Nur? Didn't you hear the words of Allah who told Nuh to tell his people, make istighfar, and Allah will send the heavens upon you in abundance, will aid you, will bless you, will multiply you? That's why I'm telling them this. It's the secret. It's the treasure. People understand it. They'll resort to it in all circumstances of life. Then he says that Allah tells us further how he spoke to them about Allah. وَقَدْ خَلَقَكُمْ أَطْوَارًا Remember the message? It's essential to bring back people to Allah. Remind them about the blessings of Allah and His power. Allah created you, He told them, in atwar, in stages. He's saying essentially reflect on how you're created. You remember how you're created? Allah always reminds us of this. Those who deny the existence of God, Allah says, do you remember how you were made? Right? You were made from dust. Then the dust turned into, um, subhanAllah, uh, a fluid. You know, the semen, the fluid the egg and the sperm, subhanAllah, a drop. He says, you forgot, you came from that. And then it turned into a clot of blood. And the clot got, um, uh, uh, you know, settled into the womb, right? And then it turns into an infant. And the infant is born. And, the, uh, you know, and within the womb, <clears throat> the flesh develops and the bones develop. And suddenly it's a full human body that grows after you know uh, birth and and grows into youth and into older age and 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 stages Allah says this is you know why stages Allah creates us gradually in stages because they contain marvels amazing signs of Allah's power Allah's blessings that we grow like a plant we you know we don't just come into existence with our full form to show us his power I, I came from nothing this is enough to you know, to bring us back to Allah. But people who are arrogant and blind, they don't see into their distant past or their futures. They cannot reflect deeply because their channels and faculties of perception have been blocked off completely and because, because of the veil of arrogance. But yet that's what Noah told them. So he's having them reflect on Allah's power reflections 
so that they can have reverence for Allah. Then he tells them, haven't you seen how Allah created the seven heavens, one above the other? And then he placed the moon as a, as a light and then placed the sun as siraj, as a, as, a, as a lamp of radiating light. Who put them there? Who initiated them? Why are they there? For our own well-being. And it is he, Wallahu anbatakum min al-ardi nabata. Isn't Allah who brought you out of earth like a nabat? Nabat is plant. So he's telling them, you're like a plant. You and I are like plants. In the same way, look at the parallels that contain these wonders of Allah. You grow up like a plant. I'm looking at through my window the trees here. We're all trees. Came from earth. Seed that grew gradually penetrated or came gushed out of this earth, penetrating the soil and into and grew into a tree. SubhanAllah. All of us are in the same way. Then one day the leaves will fall and we're going to go back to earth. The parallels are amazing. And Rasulullah tells us even when we're in our graves, before the day of judgment, before resurrection, nothing is left of us but the tailbone, the human body in the grave. And then Allah will pour rain on it. And he says it's going to grow like a plant. SubhanAllah. Like the parallels in creation are amazing. If somebody really reflects on this, they say, La ilaha illallah. Otherwise, who's God? Me? You? Who's, who's God? Who made this? We couldn't make it. We couldn't conceive it. It's so miraculous. That's how he's talking to his people. This is one of the most essential things to uh, help people understand their journey. And, and within it are miraculous signs that would really humble the human being and make them see their source to acknowledge there is no God but God. Then he says, and he made earth for you spread out to enable you to live on this earth like a carpet spread out. And he made subul and fijaja. He carved out paths for you between mountains. Why? To facilitate living because Allah is merciful. You forgot that. You're taking your gifts for granted. You need to have reverence for Allah. Then at the end of the surah, so Nuh says, قَالَ رَبِّ, رب إِنَّهُمْ عَصَوْنِي وَاتَّبَعُوا مَنْ لَمْ يَزِدْهُ مَالُهُ وَلَدُهُ إِلَّا خَزَيَا Ya Allah, they didn't do anything but disobey me despite all these reminders. And they only followed the one who had wealth and children. See, people are fooled by appearances. They thought their power can be gained by connecting to people who are wealthy and people who have lots of children and resources and men around them, right? That's the appearances fool people. That's what they thought would be the source of their strength. But he said, when they follow people like this, they've seen that they gained nothing by loss. But loss, you know, you know, a lot of the people that we try to impress in life, we try to please and worship. Wallahi, they don't even benefit us physically. They're often stingy, in fact, right? You notice powerful people can keep the good to themselves, but yet people worship them out of false hope. Khasara. He said they didn't increase them with anything but loss and perdition, but yet they continue to worship them. And then further, وَمَكَرُوا مَكْرًا كُبَّرًا They continue to scheme, Ya Allah. Scheme over and over. They're such wicked people that they schemed against Nuh, against the truth, and against good people. See, the people of Nuh also try to shut off, shut off, and silence the righteous people in their society. To oppress them, to suppress them, to contain them. They schemed against them. Isn't that what we also witness nowadays? So they don't stop their evil, their sin. No, no, it has to spill over and they they end up harming all the all of society so Noah is concerned about the well-being of society he's saying ya allah that's what they're doing and in verse 23 he says about how they told each other don't abandon the worship of your idols don't abandon don't abandon they're kind of egging each other on to persist in their worship in their pagan worship right this is the painful spot for Noah. he says ya allah these people, my people, adallu kathira. My my main pain with them is that they have caused many others to be misled. See, this is a very important. We oftentimes fail to understand. Wicked people, misguided people, are not just kind of keeping their wickedness and misguidance to their homes. No, they're going making efforts out, out of their homes to conspire to spread their misguidance. Nur doesn't want others to be harmed. You know, innocent people... Uh, unassuming people who don't know any better, they're going to be influenced by, by, the, by, the, by the evil forces, by the corrupt people, because they're keen to make everybody abandon the worship of God, abandon the truth, right? So Noah is concerned for others who are being impacted 
misguided and misled by these oppressors in his society. Then Allah says, 25, See, they've been persisting in this way for centuries. Then what happened from Allah? Here's what's happened. Remember, Nuh said, if you just seek istighfar, Allah will open the heavens for you like a faucet with rain and provision. Midrar. But he said, if you don't, what's going to happen? The same sky will pour down rain on you so much that it does what to you? Floods you. So the source of rahmah became a source of torment. And the rain that could have been a mercy for them became a, a flood for them that surrounded them completely. And it's, a, it's also symbolic. Not only were they completely destroyed when the flood of Nuh came, the flood of Nuh came. Allah sent the flood. All of them were dead. Water engulfed them from all directions. They drowned because before they were drowning in their wickedness and evil. And remember, they put garments around themselves, concealing themselves completely. So appropriately, Allah sent the flood like a garment that completely drowned them. SubhanAllah. Right? Very appropriate and perfect consequence for the way they've lived their lives and it's very symbolic as well and suddenly in that state they couldn't find any aid for them beyond Allah we often seek aid through others Allah says the aid is me then Allah concludes the surah by saying by telling us the conclusion of Nuh's conversation with Allah he made a dua so the end of the surah is a dua of Nuh what is a dua? رَبِّ لَا تَدَرْ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ دَيَّارَ إِنَّكَ إِنْ تَدَرْهُمْ يُضِلُّ عِبَادَكَ وَلَا يَلِدُ إِلَّا فَاجِرًا كَفَّارًا رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيَّ وَلِمَنْ دَخَلَ بَيْتِيَ مُؤْمِنًا وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَلَا تَزِدِ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا تَبَارًا Three verses, beautiful message. Excuse me, dua of Nuh. What is he say? He said, Ya Rabbi, don't leave on this earth any of these ungrateful disbelievers He's talking about the oppressing people in his community, of course, and anybody who follows that path. Don't leave a single one of them. Then he says, Ya Allah, he's talking to Allah. If you leave any of them, they're going to further what? Mislead and misguide others, Ya Allah. Right? They don't stop. They're so corrupt that they'll spread their corruption on earth and mislead others away from the truth. And when they bear children, they're not going to bear any child except a child that is wicked and ungrateful. Now, why is he saying this? Because he's seen it generation after generation. And then he says, in conclusion, first of all, let me tell you something on this. Does it sound like a vindictive dua? It is not. He made this dua. Because oftentimes we say, you know, we pray for mercy. But Nuh prayed this dua after Allah decreed that these people will not believe because of their behavior. He said, these people are not going to believe. Leave them alone. Khalas. Hundreds of years have passed, not hundred years, you got to leave. That's when he made the dua. And he's so concerned again, that's why he made this dua about the well-being of others who are being misguided. He's witnessed with his eyes how generations of good people were swayed by the falsehoods and the corruption of these wicked forces in his society. So he says, don't leave a single one of them on this earth because they're devastating and destructive. And when they produce children, the children follow their way. Ya Allah, purge this earth. And indeed, the, the flood of Nuh purged earth of all evil. Cut off the root of evil and start earth anew. Right? But he doesn't end the dua here. He ends it with, what was the message of Nuh to his people? Seek what? Maghfira. So he applied it to himself. And he said, Rabbi ghfirli. Ya Allah, I want that forgiveness. Ya Allah, forgive me. He doesn't stop. Wali waliday, and he didn't forget his parents. My parents, Ya Allah, he didn't stop there. Not just me and my family. And Ya Allah, all the guests that enter my home as believers, because he had a lot of people coming to his home as believers, believed him. Ya Allah, forgive them and their families too. Does he stop? No. Wali al-mu'minin al-mu'minat. Ya Allah, all the believers of all generations, of all places, the ones that I see now and the ones that I've not seen in the past, and in the future, until the end of time, Ya Allah, pour down your forgiveness on them. The believer makes dua for others, brothers and sisters. One of the greatest blessings we can make is to say, Ya Allah, forgive the believers in my home, my guests, the whole community, and all the believers across history until the end of time. When you do this, for each individual, you're going to get a blessing. You're going to get your own forgiveness. Can you imagine how much that is? Just by you saying, Ya Allah, forgive the believers, men and women, young and old, living and dead. 
and Allah will connect you to all of them. You'll enter into this righteous, beautiful company. And you'll have an emotional bond, spiritual bond with the generations of believers throughout time. It's a powerful dua that will earn you lots of blessings. And he says, Don't increase the wicked except nothing but perdition because of, again, his concern. We end here, inshallah. We open the floor for um, questions or comments. Assalamu alaikum. I'm sorry to introduce so quickly. I just take a few minutes. I have to leave. Some of course, of course. Go ahead. The, uh, about the Prophet Nuh salam, he was preceded by Prophet Idris. He, and followed by... Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Can you repeat, Dr. Mir, what I did mean, you say? He was, yeah, he was preceded by oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Prophet Idris. Mm -hmm. And uh, after him was uh, Prophet Hud. And uh, as uh, in, in our Islamic uh, okay, go ahead. In our in our Islamic I mean, faith, is Adam Adam is followed by Idris and followed by uh, Prophet Noah. Right. Of course, there is Seth. Seth was a Nabi. I think he was a Nabi, uh, from whom uh, whom he was uh, followed by Idris and Idris followed what Seth was uh, the, the son of. Uh, Adam al -Haslam. My question here is, so there were just, uh, if you go direct from Skir from Hadith Adam, Prophet Adam, followed by Idris and then Noah, just three steps, just three steps. That means, and in not so many people, and in, 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 in Noah, the Prophet Noah al -Haslam, every person who was wicked, he did not follow, they were all drowned. Right. Only the persons who were righteous remain in the in the in the in the, in the boat, in the ship, and they survived. How come uh, the idolaters came afterwards? It should have been a progeny. I mean, progeny all righteous people because only righteous people lived in the, in in that in that in that flood. That's not got all destroyed. There were no other idolaters because if you go down, Prophet Idris go further. Prophet Adam. Of course, in between Seth. So I can understand how, why from these people idolaters came and they sustained till present time. Hmm. Um, so, so you're talking about why Allah, if I understood correctly, right? So Allah, as we've seen, he's in, 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 in specifically in the time of Nuh, at the end of the life of Nuh, he purged all of earth of all idol worship, pagan worship, cleansed earth. So shouldn't it continue, right? Well, that's the test of Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah Azza wa Jal has, gives human beings opportunities. But Allah, there's a couple of layers. There's a lot we can say about this. But what this incident reveals is that Allah Azza wa Jal does not tolerate evil. It's only a matter of time before he purges it. And if it's not going to be, and he reveals to us his power, this flood was a, an indication of Allah's power to completely exterminate all evil. Right? Allah decreed out of his wisdom. It was needed at the time. Allah wanted to teach all humanity a lesson about his power, capability, that nothing will frustrate Allah. But it's only a matter of time. The tipping point would reach. So he cleansed earth. It doesn't mean people will not be misguided again, will not follow evil. The shaitan never leaves until the day of judgment, right? The shaitan is, well, until the end of life, right? He's with us. He's not going to leave. He's going to continue to afflict people, whisper, misguide, and spread his corruption and people will always there will always be corrupt evil people so the sunnah of allah the way of allah will continue so evil will bubble up spread again right so but allah reminds us don't think it has a way right it's sooner or later it's going to have to end and if it wasn't for this there was no need for you know us to make an effort imagine if since the time of Nuh, everybody's an angel well, what's the point then? What's the test? There's no test anymore. And it's impossible because we are human beings born with will. We're going to make choices and the shaitan is there. Make sense? So this way continues until the day of judgment. But Allah showed us how he's capable of ending all of it. And one day, by the way, a great flood will happen. Not necessarily a physical flood. The flood of the day of judgment. When the trumpet is blown, Allah Azza wa will end all evil on this earth once and for all. Purging all of it. And a new earth will emerge. That is completely cleansed. So at a point at which 
all this would end one sentence is going to happen but not now it's on the day of judgment if i understood com you know correctly your question dr Mir. i hope i did that means uh, that means the person who were in the boat saved by, uh, yes, by yes. One of Allah, were all righteous then yes. some and of, were, some yeah. of and them they, deviated again and they had children and the children had children and and they started again to 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 deviate. away from allah and by the way you know how it starts let me tell you so go to verse 23. The people of Nuh said to each other, Don't abandon the worship of your idols. Their names are Wad, Suwa, Yavut, Ya'uq, Nasr. Who are they? These are five figures who were heroes, according to the reports, the accounts, good, righteous people that came before Nuh. And people loved them, followed them, but after they died, they erected statutes for them to 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 uh, commemorate them and honor them, right? To remind people. But then the next generation saw the statutes, and they started to worship. They took the statutes as gods and started worshiping them. And later generations followed this way to the point of Nur, who, who in whose people said, oh, keep, keep keep worshiping these idols, right? How did it start with righteousness? So the shaitan never comes and tells you, tells you right away, disbelieve in God. No, he'll tell you, oh, go worship this, go worship that, right? Until truth is completely gone. So the people of Nuh who were saved were good. Their families were good. But then they bore children, and the children bore children. And slowly but surely, the, the way of the shaitan worked its way in, right? Until they started worshiping idols again, until the day of what? Rasulullah Until our day and age. Now our people are not worshiping stone idols they're worshiping other things right but the worship of other idols uh, idols other than god continues until the end of time thank and you will always much. be there right barakallah thank, 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 thank you very much good thank having you jazakumallah khair take care inshallah of yourself may allah bless you so i have a i have a question slash comment and then uh then i have a specific question afterwards so the comment i have is i think it's at least from what i can see it seems to be more accurate to say not that allah eventually eliminates evil i think the test has been begin going on since the beginning of time it'll go on i think case after case whether it's this case of hazrat new hazrat lud various different cases where he draws the line is when the non-believers or the disobedient uh, people create such a mass um, appeal and create a culture where they start to influence uh, innocent people. So, I mean, I, I look at it as like, okay, this is a test for all of us then uh, the poor ones who are born in a time and in a culture, in a society where the wrong things are so intrinsically believed and adhered to, that our, our test becomes harder. So Allah probably feels for those people to say, well, once you have created such a, um, almost like a culture of this disbelief and disobedience, uh, even though you've been warned um, abundantly, this is kind of where he draws a line. This, this is just the, what it seems to me, because if it was about removing evil, he would, you know, that's because a lot of people ask that. Like, if you say that, people say, well, then there's so much evil here. Why is he not removing these people? So anyway, that, that seems, I always answer from that perspective of, you know, uh, to what extent we, evil people will always be there, but once there's such an abundance of them and they create this culture where it becomes very difficult. And you see a lot of references here that Hazrat Nu is trying to make uh, to say, please, please, you know, he, you can see he's worried about the ones who are being corrupted. Anyway, uh, the, the, the question that I had was, can you please clarify the difference between a prophet and a messenger? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jazakallah khair, Professor Kamran, beautiful point, very insightful, right? First, as to when Allah does things, it's in his knowledge. That's why, remember Sabr Jamil? I'm going to keep referring to this concept. 
we often doubt, we often question God as to the timing. Who are we to understand the complexities of creation and when something is appropriate? If it was, look at what we do with our children. Oftentimes we want to beat them into change. It's not going to happen at their timetable. You have no control over hearts. Things happen, the seeds are planted, and it, the tree grows according to its timetable, not yours and mine. If it was left to us, we wanted to become a tree of dates and apples or in a second. Nothing happens this way. Similarly, evil and the dispensation with evil is going to happen according to Allah's timetable. Allah knows how to bring about the good in creation. And remember, even evil serves as an opportunity for good people to step up, right? When we're challenged, the best of us can come out. It's a choice. So first, it's in the knowledge of Allah. But Kamran said there's a point at which this evil is bubbling over and spilling over and it starts to affect the rest of sudden there's a culture that really misguides and misleads people beautiful point come on indeed that's at the point at which allah Azza wa is like here we go we're reaching this tipping point but as to how and when it manifests is in the knowledge of allah but that's really the 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 the, the, the really the tipping point of corruption when it permeates society and everybody's getting impacted and innocent people and look at our children now now in this day and age how they're completely surrounded and folded in a culture that marginalizes Allah marginalizes God that it forces upon them particular lifestyles etc cetera, etc cetera. it's force it's not even like here you have a choice oh, let me give you the two no 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 it's a point at which a conversation even about God is unacceptable right about moral values etc cetera, etc cetera. so immorality spreads and these people will not stop at anything but to make you become like them right so that's a tipping point indeed uh, as to the difference between rasul and nabi so the words are rasul and nabi right so there's like over 120,000, 124 128 remember uh nabis right but there's rasuls prophets and they're only like the 24 that we know about, right? Um, and these are, how are they distinguished from the th tens of thousands of, of, of MBA, right? Messengers of God versus prophets. The prophet was also given <clears throat> a sharia, a legislation from Allah Azza wa Revelation came to them or legislation mm -hmm. from Allah Azza wa The MBA might have come to confirm earlier message, but they didn't necessarily come with a new legislation. Make sense? So they might not have come with new logic. Yeah, that makes sense. But the prophet initiates a new, not necessarily way, it's the same message, but the legislation is different because it's appropriate for their people. So Allah distinguished and elevated them. So they have additional kind of, uh, 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 you know, um, um, things that Allah have given them for the people that they came to, as opposed to just reiterating reminding them of the earlier messages make sense so the legislation yes what distinguish and some of them were given revelation in fact right as opposed to the mba they didn't receive revelation or new legislation that's what okay. thank I you remember like somehow like think about it, over hundred twenty thousand. that means allah spread his messengers throughout earth and time in ways that are astounding we don't know these people that shows you how much allah has any like uh delivered how much how much of his reminders have been throughout time and how keen he was to send teachers and mentors and guides for, for all of us through all nations on this earth. Zakallah khair, Kamran. Barakallah feek. Um, Tarif, I have a question for sure. you. Sure, um, good to see you. Good morning. Uh, so the, my question is um, that we, the calamities have continued to come just like the calamities of rain and the flood for the people that uh, Quran describes in detail. These calamities, and if the calamities like fire in California or other places, the calamities, and if we consider them, uh, are we going to consider them as uh, uh, azab or as, uh, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And if that's the case, then uh, these punishments are keep coming in uh, and, and people are people die in uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of people, they die. Um, are they, all these people are being punished for the wrong things that they have done? Uh, just like uh, Nuh has said in his, in his uh, uh, prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that punish them. Uh, is it the punishment uh, given to us or given to people? 
just like uh, news nation? Dr. Ali, a very good question. Uh, unlike, so unlike the case of Nuh, السلام, he's a messenger, he's a prophet of Allah, Rasul, and Allah Azza wa reveals things directly to him. Nuh, uh, Allah communicated to him that these people reached that tipping point, that they're no longer going to believe. So he was informed about things you and I were not going to be informed about, right? So they have an insight into the story right into the reasons into what something is or isn't because they have direct communication with Allah we don't have that we don't have that so Noah understood that the flood when it came it was a punishment of Allah torment that's it there's no other interpretation because Allah gave him the truth, right in our case Allah shows that throughout time Allah will send it's not necessarily torment. It could be a torment because people bring it to themselves. Do you notice that a lot of the afflictions that happen to this earth, we produce them. Literally, we produce them. Like, look at climate change. We cannot blame God for the disasters that have come out of messing or tampering with the climate. The, the, the CO2 emissions, the melt, which caused the melting of the, the, you know, the, 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 the ice caps and so on and so forth, producing you know, upheavals in the atmosphere and on earth and in the in the oceans, right? In the destruction even of Wallahi habitat, animal and plant habitat that have always existed and thrived on this earth, literally destroying the ecosystem. So the disasters that come out of this, Allah says, it's you just tampered with the laws of God. So you're reaping, you're seeing the consequences of your own <clears throat> environmental, etc. So we have a hand in this. Number two though, when Allah sends these mini, you know, mini kind of uh, calamities, they always have many meanings to them. Among them is a reminder. They wake people up. So it's actually a blessing. Look at the pandemic when it happened. Many people have been awakened. Many people have, alhamdulillah, humbled, been humble by seeing that we, we, we human beings have no power or capacity that a small, tiny virus is capable of upending earth because we grew arrogant. Nations have become arrogant, right? So some heed it. It's a blessing from Allah, it's a reminder. It's like sometimes we need to be nudged, but some people don't. Some people will continue to be blind. Some people, as soon as things ease up, they go back to their normal way. So they are a blessing of God because they're reminders. And within them is also a form of torment because Allah Azza wa chose this path to be a path of toll, but the torment serves as a reminder as well. Make sense? So we're not to say that such and such calamity is like the equivalent of Nuh's flood because <coughs> that was really khalas, the ending of these people as decreed by Allah and Nuh was uh, made to understand that, received that news from Allah. Azza. We on the other hand, when we see a calamity, we say, may Allah have mercy on us. Yes, it is a form of torment. Yes, it is a reminder. Yes, it is a blessing. All of it is contained within this calamity, right? So it wakes people up. That's why I say, subhanAllah, even the disasters are opportunities. Blessings my Allah my question, so, my question in this right. issue is that even in the surah, in, in the uh, prayer of uh, Nu, the last part that he says that forgive my parents, forgive uh, all those people who come to my home and all those people who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he specifically prayed for them. Now, when a calamity comes in, and everybody is engulfed in that calamity, then there must be some good people and the, who have to pay for their... Even uh, no said that I'm going to get some people out in my boat who are good. But, and so he gave, uh, but we don't have that option. Suppose there is some calamity comes in. We, I don't have that option. I'm going to die with those people who are, have done bad, change the climate. I didn't change the climate, but I will be also punished. Right. So the question simply is that, what is the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this? Right, beautiful. That's a test of the believers. Remember the believers, even in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, beautiful, again, very, very good, insightful point, Dr. Ali. It does, we're going to go through toil. And it's not necessarily punishment. That's my point. Even for the, even for the ungrateful, the, the oppressor is being awakened. Look at the rahmah of Allah. If he didn't send the illness and the calamity, and nobody would be awakened. For, for even the grateful, even the oppressor, Allah gives him respite, just as the people of Nuh, generation after generation. But in the process, the believers are going to be, some will be killed, some will be affected by the disasters, the calamities. Allah will always, by the way, keep good people, righteous people on earth throughout time. As to who Allah knows, 
But it doesn't mean, you know, in the time of Rasulullah, many people were murdered. People are murdered till today. People are, subhanAllah, their homes are, are, are flooded and, and they're innocent and they're righteous. It doesn't mean it's torment. No, it's not torment. They're in the mercy of Allah because Allah never meant for this life to be Jannah. Allah says, even the ones that you think uh, were treated unjustly, oppressed, and they never really saw the fruits of their patience. They're with Allah. That's why he says, Don't think the ones were martyred and they were like finished off, tortured and killed, dead. He said, don't call them dead. They're alive with Allah receiving their provision. But that's the way of Allah. The path of life is toil. It's very hard. And many people will be, will be killed in the process and they're innocent. Many people, many people will die out of illness, out of calamities, out of the virus out of floods and 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 and, and uh, fires and they're innocent yeah allah is with them allah is not gonna their jannah is in the next world not here and allah will shower them with blessings and will cleanse them of all of their toil and fear and and distress so for some it is torment for others it's a blessing right but as i said it's not jannah here right so but but you're right but only allah knows for all of us what we should see the calamity as is an awakening from allah Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's really an if I, if I may, please. This is Nabi. So what Dr. Alim is asking and what you're saying is basically these, since Allah is fair, and essentially you see good people who basically are hurt with these calamities, it's in a way a taste of faith. Because mm -hmm. since Allah is fair, we just have to believe that their rewards are not lost. They're going to get their rewards, but we don't know and we don't see how. Mm -hmm. The other thing I just want to add is, I find it interesting that uh, in this surah, Sayyidina Nuh at the start, he asks, or he tells his people, basically, you turn to Allah, Allah will uh, basically give you or delay to a certain time. And then the end, he asks that Allah will basically torment all these people who don't believe because he was told they are not going to believe. While Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when these oh, people were hurting him, and Allah offered him that he punish them all. He asked to give them more time because he said that may some of their offsprings will be good Muslims. Mm -hmm. Can you just comment on that and expand? Which, which part specifically, Nabil, can you repeat? No, I got, I got what you said, but the, when you said comment, I missed that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's essentially, you know, on one hand, uh, Sayyid Nanu asked that people punish what? these people who do, who he's, he's told they're not going to believe. So you're saying at what point you say that, right? No, but Sayyid Muhammad asked that he will uh, basically ask Allah not to punish his people and give them a chance because he says may, probably some of their off, right. offsprings will be like Muslims. That is true. That is true. So it's a beautiful question. So the messengers of Allah are, are constantly, if you look at all their language with Allah, has always been one where they, they pleaded with Allah for his mercy upon his people that subhanAllah, Allah will produce good out of them, etc, etc. Uh, and that's been the kind of the, the, the hallmark of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's kind of appeal to Allah Azza wa Jal. Don't pay attention to the fact that there are times in the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he asked for what? the for Allah to to punish the oppressors so it doesn't mean that it's a it's like there is not a point even in the life of Rasulullah where he just as he after Ta'if said yeah Allah don't destroy them because Allah sent Jibreel with the angel of the mountains who says I'll crush them with the mountains I'll collapse the mountains of them he said don't do that no please 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 because maybe from their children will come out good good people they're foolish people right but there are times when the oppressors of Mecca carried on with their, with their defiance and their persecution so much that as Kamran said, they're really harming and their harm is not ending. That Allah, Rasulullah made dua for Allah to get rid of the chiefs, right? So it's at the point at which Allah himself reveals to the prophets that these people are hopeless. And it's at the point at which they make dua even against them. Do you notice, no, hundreds of years have passed Allah made him see now that these people will never produce good progeny. He always had hope. Always had hope. Otherwise, he wouldn't have worked night and day for generations. 
So what he's saying in his conversation with Allah is something that he already been through by Allah. <laughs> Right, so Allah told him these are hopeless people. So he said, "Yeah." He, so he confirmed. He said, "Yeah, Allah, these are really oppressors." And notice his language is "Wala tazidil zalimin." Ya Allah, don't increase the unjust, the oppressors. Oppressors don't can keep the sin to themselves, as you know, Kamran again said. They really produce this culture of destruction. Right, that point at which that that at which it happens is only known to Allah, but prophets were given special knowledge that they knew at that point, so they made that dua, right? But it's also the dua is beautiful because it shows us that no matter what, um, you know, even though there is a message of mercy and love and so forth and hope for others, there's a point at which you need to draw that line. And the oppression is so uh, severe that it really destroys people, right? Harms them beyond comprehension. And it's it's okay to make, you know, Allah says, أَلَا لَعْنَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَى الظَّالِمِينَ Right? Allah said it. I mean, Allah says, I don't joke with oppressors. Allah. The curse of Allah is upon the oppressors. So, you know, in Allah, asks al madlum. Sometimes we say, oh, no, we need to be careful about our du'as. No, no, no. There is a point. The madlum, the one who has been oppressed, go, let's put ourselves in their shoes. The refugees, the one whose, life, whose families have been tortured and maimed and they, do they have now a right, for example, to make dua against the oppressor? Absolutely, it's a natural instinct of the human being to make dua against the oppressor. So Allah's teaching us dua against the oppressor is also legitimate. The oppressors is very legitimate. And it's a natural instinct of the human being when we are on the receiving end of injustice. But it's easy for somebody who's not to kind of, you know, honestly make judgments against others because sometimes we tend to be uh, uneasy with these duas. And Allah says, no, no, there is nothing wrong with them, but the predominant tone is one of hoping for mercy for everybody. Does it make sense? I hope I... It's really, really, these are very sophisticated points that you guys are making and nuanced. And it's a nuanced also answer, so to speak. But I hope it's... Tarif, coming. I have a comment. Go ahead, Shahid. Uh, I think the story of uh, Nuh al salam is a very uh, strong and very good uh, lesson learning from the human beings. But uh, unfortunately, a big chunk of people are not following this, the stories of the prophets. Right. No, absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. And these stories are, are an encapsulation of all of our journeys and the journeys of society. And you see, notice they keep replicating in the pattern of the story of the people of Noah. SubhanAllah, that's why it's so powerful. We're not learning, actually. That's no, we're not. It's hard to learn and internalize. And that's why you need reminders. By the way, <coughs> Quran speaks to you and me. And you know, even on a personal level, we might be also mimicking those behaviors within our homes, right? Right, yeah. And uh, Allah says, be careful, the flood is coming. And the ultimate flood is not necessarily a flood on this earth. Allah shows us mini floods. Like the pandemic is a mini flood, so to speak, right? It's a reminder. It's an awakening. There's a grand flood that is going to happen at the sound of the trumpet. Earth will be over flooded. And that's it, it's over. Allah says there's a point at which it's over. So that's the tipping point, right? And we need to internalize it. But inshallah, Zakallah khair. And there's beautiful, intimate things also. Not just the big lessons here about oppression. And Allah says also, what do you seek from me? Do you notice, Nuh Ali said, I'm going to, before many of you leave, if you were to say, what are the practical things I can take home with me? Journey is hard. Be patient. Make istighfar to Allah. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, don't give up on istighfar. Like, hold your masbaha, hundreds of istighfars a day. Allah will relieve you. Wallahi, and, and seek it when you're afflicted, when you're distressed, when things are not working out, make istighfar to Allah. Allah will open the heavens for you, inshallah. And it's Allah knows when, how, but rest assured, Allah's mercy is coming down. And it's with you. Number <laughs> two is to make a lot of dua to Allah. And for forgiveness, now we say again, forgiveness for yourself, your family, parents, and all the believers. These are practical things. And to open your heart and share your pain with Allah. Do you notice that's what Nuh did? SubhanAllah, these are practical, real things we can implement right away that we desperately need. Uh, Lala, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Everyone, first of all, let me correct something. You say Allah will open the, uh, uh, heaven for us. The heaven been always open. This is where we come from. We are going back to heaven, actually. It's in open. You never get close. You choose to go back there or you choose to go to hell. 
So I'm going back to um, some comment here about, uh, uh, because this is the question about fair, fairness. And I heard one brother who say, the good people get punished from the bad people. I, I wanna tell you this, um, whatever happened about calamity, Muslim or non-Muslim or believer or not believer, good or bad, Allah know better because everything he sent us, we deserve that, he knew. So like, let me give you an example. Let me say in my place, there are many, let's say just uh, evil people. I, I pretend I'm a good person, but the, the community hate all of us. He know better, maybe deep inside of me, I know I'm, I'm doing bad things. So whatever Allah sent to us, we deserve that. He knew better. He knew better. And I, again, I, I say that again. Even uh, our gender food has been always open forever. This is where we come from, and this is where we're supposed to go back. Now you choose. There are, and there are another question about the evil thing. From the day one, there are our gender to food and uh, they have the Jahannam. So there are always a balance, they're good and bad. You choose to use, <coughs> but that's why the, the Nabi of Allah, they come to help us how we can go back again to Adana to serve us. Allah, that's only my comment for today. Jazakallah khair, Sister Lala. Again, mashallah, beautiful points. And, you know, everything is the knowledge of Allah, but uh, Brother Nasser also, like, sent a bunch of verses. Um, and there are, you know, numerous references in the Quran as to the meaning of trials, as to also the severity of the punishment of Allah. And I want to highlight something about this. So first of all, you know, I love this, Zakallah khair, Brother Nasser, for the reference on فَلَوْلَا إِذْ جَاءَهُمْ بَأْسُنَا تَضَرَّعُ Only if, after our afflictions have hit them, they're تَضَرَّعُ تَضَرَّعُ is they were humbled, like a broken branch, like a cut off branch. So these calamities are supposed to humble us, awaken us, and bring us back to the, to the, to the awareness that Allah is the one, right? We, we're nothing but humbled creatures. But Allah says they never humbled themselves because of the calamity. But their hearts have hardened. Allah says, oh, see, see, that's how many people react. And um, Allah says, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابُ Sometimes we as Muslims are, don't emphasize or understand that well enough. We, we almost like want to become like others. All we want to talk about is mercy, 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 mercy. But forget about the other significant aspect of Allah that he emphasized, شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابُ Allah is not to be joked with. Allah is to be revered. Allah punishes, even on a, on a personal level in our lives. Yeah, Allah continues to give us opportunities and forgive us and have mercy on us. But let's not take Allah lightly. Allah is to be respected. And Allah put down a law to actually, yes, produce consequences for evil and, 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 and sin that is persistent, that is, that is not, you know, for, for, against which we never seek forgiveness. So the point is, Allah wants us to know that He's severe in punishment. And he's just, not just, you know, Rahman, Rahim, but the other aspect that is also to be emphasized, even though not to be necessarily focused on, the focus is on the Rahman of Allah, but also this aspect cannot be neglected. And sometimes, as I said, tend to think it's a light thing. It's not a light thing with Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah is real and Allah punishes and Allah is just and Allah does not let go of, uh, of evil. It has to be, uh, it has to meet its end with Allah Azza wa Jalla in a very severe way too. Right, so very important point in the surah as well. Yeah, yeah, but that is, when, when you say uh, Allah is shadid uh, al-iqab, mm -hmm. is essentially for people who are doing evil willingly. I mean, when somebody is pious and he's doing the right thing, he may make mistakes, and Allah is ghafoor rahim. Of course, yeah, of course, absolutely, exactly. Yes, yes, and that's the message of the Quran. That's why I said with evil. When we speak of evil, it's intentional, it's conscious, and it's, it's an evil that didn't heed, despite the reminders. <laughs> so, I wanted to... Allah keeps talking about corruption. They spread the corruption. They spread the injustice. They spread the evil. They don't even, they're not even humble about it. They chose Amma. Right? That was intention. Blind, right? It's, they, it's the intention. Person. Go ahead, Fafi. So, uh, uh, I wanted to... Uh, and this last verse that um, that Brother Nasser sent crystallized it. Uh, it. It has been in my head for a long time now, as we were talking, which is 
you know, this last verse, it's addressed to the people of the book. And then when you were uh, uh, talking about how these previous messengers became idols uh, mm -hmm. among news people, uh, it just occurred to me, maybe that's where uh, we're asking for forgiveness comes in. That people get the message, and and also this question of, you know, how righteous that someone had of how righteous people have descendants that become unrighteous. I mean, I think that was implicit in one of the, the brothers' questions was, uh, you know, only the righteous people survived, and then all of a sudden the the same people generations later are getting punished, and it seems to me that that plus this uh, passage d uh, directed to the people of the book that the message is delivered and it's a stag law that prevents people from losing the essence of the message maybe that um but really i'm asking it as a question that that if we don't have humility mm -hmm. if we don't constantly ask for forgiveness we don't recognize our own perfections then even if our people are given the message will corrupt it will pollute it will lose mm -hmm. the spirit of it Maybe in three generations we'll say, well, the, the message said this, but it would be better if we tweaked it, or nowadays we have different values, or whatever it might be, that without that humility, that, and I also thought of the Hadith, you know, uh, that, uh, um, that Islam arrived as a stranger and will become a stranger again. Uh, maybe I'm not quoting it perfectly, but this idea that every message, if we don't retain that humility, we'll, we'll, we'll lose it and our, our children will lose it. Does it I, and I'm rambling a little bit, but does it, does it make sense? No, exactly, Lachid Richard. Actually, I think it's, it's, it's hard to unravel these concepts and because they're infinite in their dimension. <coughs> and we're human beings with limited intellect. You hit on uh, just some key gems there. The, just the whole idea of even humility, because even in the pro the shaitan can get to us by corrupting us in evil ways, even when we are pursuing truth and, and, and righteousness. Because a human being can become so even arrogant with it that I'm I'm good and Richard is messed up, right? Oh my goodness, that's how the shaitan gets us. So he gets us through righteousness, through thinking we're better, right? To the point where we become arrogant and we're not even seeking with humility, guides, guidance and alignment. So you notice in our conversation, sometimes we become so full of ourselves, arguing, and lose that humility where we say, mm, I might have said this wrongly, that it ends up snowballing into misguiding myself and others and my children. So that's the struggle of the human being. And the point is, we need the dependence on Allah and everything, even as we seek to improve ourselves with, with righteousness and goodness, because we don't have the ability. So at every point, Allah says, turn to me to enlighten you. Be humble, acknowledge your limitations, your weakness. That's really, you hit on that key differentiator. And you see it with many religious people as well. They become so arrogant that they're willing to even kill someone in the name of the truth, right? Condemn them, etc. That's a, it just reveals this arrogance. It's called religious arrogance. But it also can be unreligious arrogance as well, but all arrogance. It's arrogance of the human being when he, even in worshiping God, he thinks God is exclusive to him right? And monopolizes the truth, so to speak, with very dangerous mode of existence. And notice this path of, the path of Islam throughout time, with our righteous predecessors and even people right now who really understand it, pursue it, they're just so humble about it, right? And it doesn't mean we don't stand up, by the way. That's another thing that is misunderstood. We tend to think sometimes like, Khalas, humble means just kind of let go, go away, disappear. No, it doesn't mean that. Otherwise, injustice will spread as well. There has to be an opportunity to really, even in seeking Allah's guidance, to stand up with, with that sense of justice and, and helping the, those who are oppressed, right? So, but it's all about humility. You said it beautifully, because we don't know. And we can easily lose it too, <coughs> easily. So, Barakallah Feek, Richard, and you were not rambling, that you surely indeed were taking us to this beautiful concept that is emphasized in the concept of maghfirah. Maghfirah is all about acknowledgement of our weakness and to humbly go and see that you need Allah. So again, it's really the practical lesson of this surah. It's powerful, it's enriching, it's transforming, it, trans it can transform our lives instantly. Uh, so anyway, any final comments, inshallah, before we end this and inshallah? Yes, yes, yes. 
Mm -hmm. I have a question. Sure. Um, I have a uh, conversation with some of my friends um, in Virginia. I went to their place and there were many brothers and sisters like us. So they've been asking me, I don't know, we, we were there and having stuff and there, and some people come to me like that. I, I don't know if it was aggressive or it was just curiosity. They were asking me, where are you from? I said, first time I ignored them, I did not answer. I'm like, okay, la, la, calm down. <laughs> Second time they asked me, where are you from? I said, I don't want my journey to fix us. <laughs> no, seriously, I use that word to just start a conversation with them to see. I said, I came from my journey to food. And they say, what? I said, yeah, you think I'm cuckoo, but I'm from the journey to food. That's if you don't understand. Oh. And they say, how come you can say, say, I'll start for law, I'll start for law. I say, I'm, I'm, I'm positive of what I'm just saying. I'm not any, I'm human being like you, but you ask me where I'm from. I say, I'm from my journey to food. Then I take them back. I say, wow, well, I ask you one question. When people die, what you guys say? <laughs> they answer me, they say, uh, to Allah we belong, to Allah we return. I say, wow, well, just uh, think about this. We all come from Aljana to for that. That's my answer from you. And you say, no, you cannot say that. That's how I'm saying. I'm <laughs> positively say that to you because you have a choice to stay somewhere else, but that's the place you will go back if you follow the guidance. Alas, it's haram to say that. <laughs> Well, you just need to know your audience. Sometimes, you know, no, it's just a lot of, but, but, you know, if you throw, sometimes we throw expressions at people and we don't know them and we're going to just confuse them further, right? But if you have a, I have a friend and I'm just trying to be playful, but it's an opening to a conversation. You know, when you pass the people's point. interest, it's like, that was my her. point. Yeah. So, you know, the way you do it, you know, this person. Alhamdulillah, you know, but you need to know, you need to know your audience. Don't throw, we don't throw terms at people. Remember, Noah said, Mubin, I'm very clear. I'm not going to confuse you. As long as we're not confusing people and furthering their distance from Allah, but, it, you know, <coughs> helping them come closer. Not to just sound and, cool. Right. So that's the point. The point yeah, is, it you was have a, the person it, you're talking to, right? <laughs> that's it. Exactly. Then my point was like, I said, just look at your body, stay in this earth. Your soul, what, what, I just asked them, where is your soul go back? It's not, in, if you, you know, say, oh, you're right, you're right, and then. But, but what I appreciate about what you're saying, here's the deal. Honestly, what I take from you, Stalala, and I think it's, inshallah, a reminder for all of us to carry that concern for people that we're here, every opportunity we have, wallahi, in, a, in wise ways and wise terms to remind people about Allah their journey back. Because if we don't help them wake up, who's going to help them wake up? That's what you're showing us in this conversation, is that the believer is constantly thinking about the well-being of others, specifically in regard to the truth of turning to Allah. But it, it requires wisdom. But we don't let that go. Out of shyness, out of fear, <coughs> which and unfortunately is, a, is, a, is something that has afflicted many people, many Muslims who are so terrified of even announcing that they're Muslim, that it's harming our children, by the way harming our children this is not you know subhanallah so people need to see our faith the beauty of it and our care and sincerity right in the best of ways and not to shy from da'wah da'wah is calling people to allah in a beautiful way that's the command of allah sure 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 so, for even you know like highlighting the need for that i think that's the, even the more important point so anyway i don't want to i'm here but i don't want to take you you know Back further from the rest of your activities for the day inshallah Whatever it is, including football, right? Whatever team you're rooting for. Um, so anyway, Jazakumullah khair, inshallah. Any, anything else urgent? No, okay. just, a, just a departing note. Mm -hmm. I like the word madrar. Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated with the word. Mm, be beautiful. <laughs> Darra means to pour, pour like an end, endlessly, right? It's like, it's not yeah. stopping. Allah says the, the sky is going to open for you. And we don't see it necessarily like you think it's just the rain. No, it's an invisible provision. Wallahi, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, aid in your life, whether it's an illness, struggle with children, distress, things are closed, make istighfar to Allah. Wallahi, hold the misbah. I'm telling you, practical. Hundreds of times a day, with full trust and faith in Allah, Allah will change our lives. Wallahi, istighfar is powerful. It's all about humility too. 
and an opportunity for transformation. That's how Allah, His mercy is amazing. It's instantaneous. Allah will let everything go away in our past and heal us from it. But also making dua for the believers. But says, Wallahi, when you leave this session today, make dua for the believers. Everywhere, throughout the generations, in all times and places. And That's my alaqsa. Okay. So let's inshallah conclude. Uh, ya Allah, you are the most merciful. You are the most beneficent. We ask you, Allah, that you bless us and enlighten us with the understanding of the Quran, your word in the Quran, to bless us with humility, Ya Allah, and to guide and humble our hearts, to soften our hearts with your remembrance, to make us heed the lessons of the story of Nuh alayhi salam, to make the Surah, Surah Nuh a companion for us, ya, ya Allah, and to make the Quran an intercessor for all of us, a companion and a means of healing and, 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 and relief from all afflictions and anxieties and distress to illuminate our hearts and minds and make us lamps of life for others around us, Ya Allah. Not to make us cave to evil, to corruption, that our hearts swerve away from your faith, Ya Allah. Make us vehicles and vessels of mercy. We ask you, Allah, that you uh, forgive us, forgive our parents, forgive our children, forgive our families, forgive our guests, just as Nuh asks you, Ya Allah, that you forgive all the believers, young and old, male and female, living or departed, Ya Allah, throughout time, Ya Allah. Forgive all of them and earn us the blessings of this dua, Ya Allah. Connect us to all of them, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, have relief on this earth, Ya Allah. Guide humanity to you, Ya Allah. Guide them to the truth and make us vessels that guide others to the truth, that we don't shy away from our faith. And ground us in the truth of our faith, the beauty of our faith, Ya Allah. And open the sama, the sky, with midrar, Ya Allah. Like a midrar, Ya Allah, because we need it. And we're in pain, Ya Allah. You know our pain, you know our grief. You know our anxiety, and that's all we need to know, Ya Allah. Relieve that from us, Ya Allah. We have none but you. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah. Make us die on that, Ya Allah. And grant us Jannat al Firdaus and the side of your face, Ya Allah. We don't need anything else but your pleasure. Allahumma ameen, Allahumma ameen. Wa salli lahumma ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Barakallah fikum, inshaAllah. Take care, brothers and sisters. I love you for the sake of Allah. Right? I know what we gather on we leave on loving each other for the sake of allah take care of yourselves inshallah until next time inshallah don't forget the next session wednesday night with the hereafter inshallah and the rest right after maghrib inshallah we'll resume with the hereafter and the other sessions in the week inshallah barakallah fikum take care assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh